Hello everyone. So this presentation is about exporting virtual memory as DMA buff. I think two to three years back we had DMA buff concept uh, presented in the same ELC. Uh, now this is just a different angle to it. Uh, just trying to uh, export virtual memory as DMA buff. So I'll just start with some introduction from my side. Won't work. Okay. So, hi, my name is Nikhil Devshatwar. I work at Texas Instruments, Bangalore, India. And mostly I work on the kernel part. So, the key areas that I work on is video subsystem, camera drivers. And recently I have started working on the Linux and uh, RTOS, implement, uh, RTOS integration. So, mostly for the automotive use cases, uh, there is a trend that uh, you want to run uh, Linux and RTOS on the same chip. So, I am working on that. So, uh, I have not much done uh, contributions in the open source community, but a few contributions from my side are done for V4L2 drivers and in the device tree compilers. Uh, okay, so this is the outline of the presentation. So, what we are going to talk about is uh, we at TI faced a problem when trying to integrate the Linux and RTOS uh, operating system uh, applications together. So, uh, we had some problems, we tried to fix it in some way and then I think that the solution that we have taken is generic enough that it can be applied to the community use cases. So, we will go through the specific solution uh, what we uh, dealt with and then we will try to jump to how this can be applied to a generic level and then we will go through the implementation details and then if there are any security concerns or if there are any questions I can take. So, I will just point out that. Uh, uh, the solution that I am trying to trying to uh, propose is not meant for all the use cases. It is only meant for like the embedded use cases. So there are some a uh, lot of assumptions behind this. Uh, I'll clarify as and when we encounter them. So uh, so this is the uh, typical use case uh, I would say in the case of integrating Linux and RTOS applications. So typically you will have like the memory divided into two parts. So that, most chunk of the memory would be uh, used by Linux and you will have a dedicated uh, memory region which is uh, uh, carved out for the RTOS. <coughs> now, you may have different types of applications accessing these memories. Uh, you will have like typical infotainment applications running on Linux, ADAS applications running on RTOS. So, this is talking, talking from the automotive uh, point of view. So, that is why I have mentioned ADAS applications. But in the middle you see that there is info ADAS. So, what I mean by that is it is informational ADAS. So, basically these are the applications where you will use the HLOS features from Linux, but at the same time you want to utilize the hardware acceleration and the algorithms that are running on the RTOS. So, if you look at that application. <coughs> So, these kind of applications would be uh, accessing the memory on the Linux as well as on the RTOS side. You can see that the buffers that it is uh, uh, using is actually red and blue which is uh, which in indicates that it is using the Linux and uh, RTOS memory. Now, the problems when we are trying to build these kind of applications is that the typical architecture does not allow you to like have accesses to uh, other memory which is carved out from Linux. So, what we want to have is we want access to the RTOS memory. At the same time, not just accessing that memory, we want to give that memory to other uh, drivers. Like typical use cases for these kind of uh, applications would be, uh, let us say you will have some camera capture running on RTOS application and there are some algorithms running on the capture and then after everything is done, you will have the video data coming in and that video data you want to display onto Linux. So, because you want to use the HLOS features, you will have the fancy graphics, GUI and uh, uh, all the stack that is running on the Linux and the standard Linux drivers uh, like the DRM and uh, uh, standard application frameworks like GStreamer, Wayland will be used to you know consume those uh, buffers coming from RTOS. Now, the requirement here is to be able to access the RTOS memory. Uh, which is not really part of the Linux that memory and share that memory with the standard Linux drivers that we have in place. <coughs> so, uh, uh, I will start with a short note on what DMA buff is. So, DMA buff is generic mechanism to share buffers across the driver. So, Linux kernel has this uh, whole framework designed in such a way that you can have one driver which is allocating the buffers and then uh, 
you can import export that buffer into just a simple uh, anonymous file descriptor. Once the anonymous file descriptor is available at the application level, you can pass this uh, descriptor all the way to different different drivers and each of the driver would be able to find out what that uh, descriptor means. So from that descriptor, you will uh, the driver will be able to figure out the physical addresses and then the corresponding uh, driver fun functions can be done. So if anyone has any questions on DM above, I would like to take that now. In this case, there is only one Linux, uh, uh, only one OS I am showing the previous diagram. In this case, these two run, uh, OS are running on the same hardware, but there is no hypervisor. These are actually running on two different processors. So, RTOS will be running on a dedicated, uh, so this is a heterogeneous architecture kind of thing, where you will have two processors, one which is, uh, let us say, uh, ARM A A15 series uh, running the Linux and you will have a typical uh, low latency uh, processor design for the uh, RTOS kind of application. So, there is no hypervisor involved here. These are just two uh, separate CPUs running to different OS and for different use cases. And the DDR is shared between Yes, yes. So, this is a typical embedded use case where you will have a common DDR, there is no separate GPU memory or anything of that sort and uh, all the memory accesses is uh, driven through a common uh, EMF interface. So, as I explained that the DM above allows you to share buffers between drivers and all that, but all of this is specific to Linux because there should be a Linux driver which exports the DM above and then of course, there are a lot of DM above importers which can take those uh, DMA FDs and then figure out what is the physical addresses and access the uh, memory corresponding to that. So, what we have done is to solve the problem that I face like we want to access the RTOS memory as well as share this memory with the uh, other drivers. So, in this case what you see here is that uh, on the left side we have the RTOS uh, uh, stack. So, what I have here is that the uh, RTOS application has uh, some memory, but this memory is mapped into the Linux space uh, by whatever means like currently you can uh, simply use uh, dev mem or you can have a uh, driver the typically the driver which is handling with the RTOS loading and uh, remote proc driver let us say you can map the memory into the uh, application. So, once you have mapped the memory you will get the virtual address. Now, this is what I mean by exporting a virtual memory as DM above. So, typical use cases in Linux you would have seen that uh, all the drivers uh, that do support DM above export are most of the time are allocators of the buffers. Like if you take V4L2 for example, DRM for examples, only the drivers which allocate those buffers are capable of exporting the uh, buffer as DM above. Now, in this case what I am trying to demonstrate here is that we have a virtual memory which is mapped into the application and then you have a completely different driver which is no connection with the memory that we are talking about, but you give the pointer of this uh, memory to the driver and it exports that memory chunk as the DM above, uh, DM above and then you can uh, get that as a file descriptor. So, the way, <coughs> yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So there will be a common uh, common bus, uh, and there are multiple uh, processors and peripherals uh, accessing the memory through that bus. So at the same time, Linux and uh, uh, RTOS can access the memory. But of course, the memory is divided. Right. So divided. Divided, as in logically divided. So, if you have like 4 GB of RAM, 1, 3 GB will be given for Linux and 1 GB or maybe half GB given for RTOS applications, so something like that. It is logically divided. Logically separated. Okay. No, no, my, my point is like the memory is there, 4 GB, it is up to the software configuration, how much you want to carve out for RTOS. Depending on the application's need, you may decide like 128 MB all the way to 1 GB depending on the application and use case that you are running on RTOS. I mean, this is a specific solution, but it does not have anything to do with the uh, idea of exporting the virtual memory. You had some question. So, uh, is there assumption that the paging subsystem is also symmetric? So, the page table, the individual pages are the same size between the ADAS application and the host. So, in other words, you're not 
like in virtualization, it's common to actually allocate large pages to uh, avoid page faults. Uh, and then other, it, you can actually have your host uh, Linux OS running with standard 4K pages. Would that present a problem? I, I'm trying to understand the underlying assumptions here with how to make this work. Yeah, so to answer your question, the concept of paging applies mostly in the case of Linux. Now, in case of RTOS, you will no, not have like like multiple layers of levels of translations. An RTOS application is as simple as you can just map a uh, address and you will start writing into it because there won't be lot of uh, paging or translations because it's very simple. The processor that is running RTOS is going to be a very simple processor, so you you won't not have the paging. Uh, paging facility there. So, it would be uh, it would be a direct access to the uh, physical addresses. So, the so the BIOS in this system is pre allocating and pinning buffers, you are not going to have any paging or any other considerations no. on these buffers. No, no. This is a dedicated always in memory resident contiguous range of yes. more than 4K or however many. Right. So, in the device tree we typically carve out some mem memory region and of course, that will be contiguous memory region and you specify those uh, region values at the start of the boot up of the RTOS processor and then uh, all the RTOS applications will be able to start allocating buffers from that region. So, I know I have uh, started with like lot of complicated uh, things, but if you have any questions uh, I would like to clarify them because I am going to build on this. Correct. Are you pumping that virtual address somehow to the user space or is this still in the kernel? No, the virtual address of course will be for the uh, meaning the mapping of that buffer is done in the application. So, the virtual address is part of the application meaning user space. Yeah. So, the point here is that you can uh, map the memory and get the virtual address and the way this is uh, the solution is designed in the way is that you get a virtual address and from that virtual address you give it to a new driver the one that is mentioned in the green box vmem exp i call it virtual memory exporter so this vmem exp driver is the one which is uh, newly created uh, driver so what it is uh, doing here is that it just takes the virtual address of any uh, memory and then it finds out what is the corresponding physical addresses corresponding to that memory and then once you have the physical addresses you can export this as a dma buff you need to implement a bunch of dma buff uh, ops operations and once you have implemented those ops then you can give this dma fd to all other linux drivers and from that point onwards all the linux standard linux drivers which are capable of importing the dma buff will be able to access those buffers using the DMA buff ops that have been implemented by the uh, VMEM EXP driver. So, so, is the input the physical address and then this, the VM, VMEM exporter returns a corresponding FT. memory mount uh, virtual address? No, so uh, it says that when, when once you get the IUCTL with the virtual address all you get is a DMA FT. So, that is just an anonymous file descriptor representing the buffer. So, it is much sim similar to what would happen let us say if in V4L2 if you let us say allow a buffer and then run an IOCTL2 let us say vbuff IOC underscore export you get a DMA buff FD. So, that is just a anonymous uh, file descriptor which is again representing to the memory. So, in so concept of DMA buff is that you user space need not uh, have a physical address or even virtual address you just get one file descriptor you can map it to get a vir virtual address, but in general when you export you just get the file descriptor and uh, the same case is happening in this case also. The only difference is that VMM AXP driver is not the owner of the buffer it just has been given a pointer to the application memory and it is trying to figure out the corresponding physical addresses based on the memory. So, uh, so this uh, was a specific solution. Now we'll try to uh, apply the same solution onto the uh, to to make it generic. So what I'm trying to explain here is that uh, 
uh, what we have done here is to uh, take a virtual memory and then export it as uh, DMA buff. The advantage that we get with this is so now you can remove the RTOS in from the picture because RTOS was only introduced for the problem that we solved. Now you can have any memory that is there as part of the application and you want to share this memory with the other Linux drivers that you have. So to work with other drivers which are capable of DMA buff import, you still want to have that memory to be represented as DMA buff. Now this driver enables you to uh, convert any virtual memory chunk into the DMA buff. So the way that, uh, uh, so the use cases that are enabled with that is you may have the memory mapped directly from let us say slash dev slash mem device, you may have that memory from file descriptor uh, uh, file or you may have this memory mapped from a different driver. So the, the possibilities here are countless, you just need to have the virtual address pointer, once you have the virtual address pointer, you just get the FD and give it to other drivers and uh, uh, from that point the use case is seamless. So the ABI here is a simple character device, you will have like a slash dev slash vmem exp uh, device and then currently there are like only 2 to 3 IOCTLs defined. So it is a character driver with custom IOCTLs defined, you just need to, uh, there is a stand, uh, there is a data structure defined where you need to pass a virtual address, once you pass the virtual address to, uh, so as it says in the diagram before. Uh, you need to pass the virtual address to the driver and once the driver is able to do all the translations, it will return a DMA FD which application can use to pass on. So as uh, you pointed out, how would you able to find out the physical addresses? Because to work with DMA buff, you need to have the physical addresses. The only way uh, all the, uh, like as I mentioned, typical DMA buff exporters have been the allocators. So if a driver is allocating the buffer, that driver surely has the physical address because that is the one which is allocating the buffer. So in case of V4L2 and DRM that is very easy, but in this case all you have got is virtual address and you need to convert that virtual address into the physical address to actually find out the different pages that the memory points to. <coughs> so the way this is achieved is by doing a software page walk. So I will go through what exactly uh, that is. So basically you have a virtual address and then you need to find out what is the, what are the different pages which are uh, mapped by that uh, virtual address and then once you have the list of all the pages that are point, uh, that are pointed by the virtual address, you can export them as DMAFT. So yeah, just highlighting one more time, the features of these drivers are like you can export any virtual address. So uh, by emphasizing any, what I mean by that is this is not specific to the RTOS uh, application. You can have me uh, memory mapped by a different driver which does not support DMA buff export. Like you will have lot of uh, C CMA drivers, like for example, Texas Instrument has this uh, driver called CMEM, which is uh, uh, used for handling the CMA regions, contiguous memory allocator, but that driver is not capable of DMA buff exporting. So you can just allocate the buffers, but once you have allocated the buffer, you cannot give it to any other driver, simply because the driver does not support uh, DMA buff export. And this is just one example, I am sure in community there are a lot of drivers which are capable of handling the CMA buffers, they are capable of allocating the buffers, you can map the buffers, but that does not have the support for uh, DMA buff export. And essentially you cannot use this with the full chain of uh, all other drivers which can only work with DMA buff import. So that is one use case which is possible by uh, you just map the uh, different memory and once you have the memory mapped into the application you can export it as DMA buff. So when I say <coughs> page table walk, so this is a, somebody had a question, all right. So this is a typical page table walk diagram that you would see like this is an example for 32 bit ARM processor where you will have like a 32 bit address. Now that address is divided into different parts like you need to go from the process specific page directory from the P PGD, PMD, PT and then you will have the offset. So in a typical uh, Linux kernel depending on the architecture you may have the size of PGD, PMD, PT depending on the architecture it may vary. This is just the example given for the 32 bit ARM processor. So the logic here is that the address is divided into multiple pieces and you just need to figure out uh, the right page uh, pointing to that. So you find out the process specific directory and uh, 
you uh, it's it's an uh, array with a uh, uh, array with the contents uh, pointing to a different page so basically you just need to take the pmd and index it with the pgd and then you will get the pt once you get the pt then uh, it's again an array of the pages you need to uh, index the page table and then you will get the actual uh, addresses so this is how the typical paging uh, works but most of this is actually done by hardware so of course all the architectures uh, i mean at least the ARM architecture, Intel architecture have support for these in hardware. So everything is happening in hardware. But in this case, what I am uh, what I am doing here is a software uh, page table work. What I mean by that is I am not really accessing. I am not really interested in accessing the memory pointed by the virtual address. What I am interested is I want to know what the uh, physical address is pointed by that virtual address. So what I am doing is I am just trying to go over the kernel data structures, trying to find out where exactly this uh, virtual address maps to. So typically the virtual address is in contiguous space, but uh, in uh, DDR uh, or in the physical space that might not be contiguous. So if you have like a range of one megabytes of uh, virtual address range, that may not mean that all the physical address is actually contiguous. You may have pages of 4K scattered all over the memory. So you will end up finding out a scatter gather list of uh, addresses for the memory chunk that was contiguous in virtual address. So this is a typical use case like in the case of contiguous virtual address, it need not be the case that the physical address will also be contiguous. Uh, any questions on the page table software page table? Your driver didn't do this, right? you use the built-in OS primitives. Of course. Yes, yes. So driver did not do the full uh, page table. So there are uh, in Linux kernel we have uh, utility functions for uh, for for page work exactly, and the driver uses those functions. Yeah. How do you handle over commit? Sorry. How do you handle over commit? Over commit. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Okay. Correct. Yeah. So that's a really nice question, actually. So uh, later in the slideshow, I, I would show that in this implementation, the current implementation, we are not triggering the page faults. So the question here is to uh, that how are we handling the over commits in the sense like sometimes your application may request that I want to allocate one megabytes of uh, memory. Now in this case kernel may not actually allocate the one megabytes of memory. So there are virtual addresses for which there is no physical address. So the only way the physical uh, pages will be allocated is when the application actually starts using the virtual addresses. Now his question is that how will you find the physical address if there is no mapping set between the virtual and physical addresses. So the only way that can happen is if you trigger the page fault. So generally the trigger the page fault will be triggered only if the application is trying to access that memory and that is generally handled by hardware because hardware the me memory management unit will just trigger an interrupt and the kernel will take care of making sure that there is a page associated with this. Now in this case you are not accessing the memory you are just trying to find the mapping but you want to make sure that there is a mapping before you try to get the mapping. So you, that can be done by triggering the page faults manually that is the theory but it is not currently implemented. Okay, sorry. Sorry? Uh, what do you mean by special mappings? So this part is done in kernel. So once the application gives the virtual address, all of the next uh, all of the next procedure is done by kernel. So kernel will get the physical address by walking through the page table. I'm not able to hear you clearly. Yes, so this is just an example, uh, depending on the architecture, it will be a different uh, PT uh, 
PMD, but uh, in kernel the APIs that are there are generic enough that the same code that we have will work on different architectures depending on the different sized PTE and P PMDs that we have. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, so I have been talking a lot about you know uh, trying to convert the virtual address into the physical address. So, but very unlikely we'll use uh, this to the extent that I have been talking about. Typically, we'll use it for the buffers which we really intend to share. Like for example, there's no point sharing a non-contiguous buffer with a driver which expects a contiguous buffer. So, let's say if you allow malloc a buffer, of course that will be contiguous in virtual address, but it will not be contiguous in the physical address space. Now you can export that buffer as a DMA buff. You will get the scatter gather list. But if you get the if you get this DMA FD and give it to a driver which expects a contiguous buffer, it will simply fail. So the dri the driver that we are talking about enables you to export virtual memory as DMA buff. But that does not mean that it solves your problem of you know it acts as a MMU. It it cannot act as an MMU. The device or the peripherals are not smart enough to. Uh, work with scatter gather. So, if the device expects physical memory, uh, physically contiguous memory, you got to pass the buffer which is actually physically contiguous. Even if you pass a, like a virtually contiguous buffer, you will get a scatter gather list with let us say 100 uh, entries. So, the imported driver will simply fail because the uh, physical buffer is not contiguous in space, uh, sorry it is not contiguous in physical space. Uh, yes. So, even if the uh, application crashes, crashes, when the application crashes, you will have all the uh, file descriptors associated with that application will be closed at the time of killing the application or exiting the application. So, it is the kernel's job to make sure that the DMA buff ref count is decreased by one every time a, a descriptor associated with that is closed. And once the DMA buff count uh, ref count reaches to 0, because when I, I am talking about ref counting because the same DMA buff will be used by multiple drivers. So, I, at at one point there would be a case where uh, when the application has crashed all the DMA buff FDs uh, will be closed one by one and at one point of time uh, the ref count of the DMA buff will go 0 and then the kernel, ha kernel callbacks gets uh, triggered in and at that point of time you can do all the cleanup that is uh, necessary to handle the scenario. Does that answer your question? All right. So, this driver supports uh, both physically contiguous buffers or uh, scatter gather uh, buffers. It is generic enough, but it is up to the usage of how you want to use it. Uh, second point I want to mention here is that uh, I have been talking about pages. Uh, what I mean by that is if you give me a virtual address which is not really page aligned. Now, it is a question about how do I share uh, this chunk of memory with another driver because I will typically share a scatter gather list with let us say these are these are all the pages that are uh, part of this uh, DMA buff. But I can include a offset, but most of the DMA buff imported drivers that are there currently they do not respect the offset. So, even if you if you give let us say 10 pages, but you say that the first first page offset is let us say 2k, the driver generally or typically ignores the offset and starts using the pages from the first byte itself. So, it is generally recommended that you try to use this method only for the cases where the physical or uh, the virtual addresses are page aligned, but it will still work for the non, non uh, page aligned uh, use cases, but it is not recommended because other drivers do not uh, respect the offsets. No, it gets the DMAFT. It's the DMA file descriptor. Yes, correct. From that DMA file descriptor, then you can get the corresponding access to the physical buffer. Underneath. Again, in the kernel space. In the kernel space. Yes. So this diagram here explains it the clearly. The address that the application is using is an application virtual address. Correct. Not the kernel virtual. Address. No. No. And that application virtual address. Yes, yes. So, I guess I'm missing something how you could actually translate from a 
arbitrary virtual address to a very specific physical address that you want to have access to? Uh, first thing, uh, in very uh, rare use cases, in embedded applications, you will not have most of the swapping in place. In case you have the swapping in place, we will have the control in such a way that whenever you are accessing uh, a specific virtual address and exporting it as DM above, the driver makes sure that the, it pins the buffer into the memory so that at any point it's of time. No, no, no. Uh, this is all happening from the Linux. So let's say if you have a virtual address, you give it to the kernel, uh, kernel driver. Now the kernel driver makes sure that this page is pinned into the memory so that kernel does not swap it out. If the kernel does not swap it out, that virtual address also remains to be same. As long as the DMA buff in question is in use. But I, I thought the original intent was you have a virtual address running up in an application and you want to associate it with one, some specific pre-allocated physical address over here in the, in the ADAS application. Correct. And, and I, I guess what I'm missing is how does this, this exporter driver know that when an application gives it a virtual address of dead beef, that dead beef corresponds to physical address A, B, C, D. Uh, by doing a page table walk, but once you have the page uh, done the page table walk, you find out the, all the pages and you you pin them. So ma you make sure that the swapping uh, swapping does not uh, swap out. Is, we can take it off. I don't want. To, I don't. I, all right. Something I'm not following. But I also don't know in your slides. Can you talk about how this compares to shared virtual memory? Is that sure. Is yeah. That oh, sorry. I have taken a lot of time. Okay. I'll just run through quickly. So. Yeah, so basically to make it generic, what I'm trying to say here is that you can map a memory, you can map a driver handle, you can map a file. And uh, for each of these use cases, you will have a virtual address and the corresponding physical addresses. So depending on what happens in the page fault handler, you may be simply accessing the memory, you may be actually reading from the file, or you may be reading from, let's say, a driver specific callback. You just trigger the page fault handler and then get the memory done. So the way this will, uh, come up in the use case is that you can uh, somehow map the memory into the application, get the virtual address and then pass this virtual address to the driver and then start sharing that memory. So yeah, as you said, now we'll move to the part where how, how does this apply to, you know, generic use cases. So I talked about the uh, regular uh, Linux frameworks like GStreamer and Wayland trying to use these app, uh, use this uh, memory. So a typical use case, uh, what you would see is uh, if you allocate from DMA buff exporter, you need to export uh, using the same driver. The first thing you have to do is allocate the memory and then you have to export it. But in this case, the advantage you can get is you can allocate first, uh, sorry, uh, you can allocate from any driver and then you can export. Like in the typical embedded use cases, you will have let's say 10 drivers, but out of them only one driver supports DMA buff export. Typically, the DRM driver which supports the DMA buff export. So you allocate from DRM and then give it to all other drivers. But in this case, you can actually allocate from a different driver. As I mentioned, there might be a CMA driver that you, you that you are interested to allocate buffers from. You can allocate the buffers from there and then simply export. So this avoids the dependency between the allocation and export. So another point uh, to look at it this way is that uh, from a GStreamer uh, use case perspective, you will have like multiple pipelines, uh, multiple elements in the pipeline. Now the way uh, some of the plugins are, or elements are written in such a way that they allocate their own memory. I mean, for example, let's say video test SRC. I'm just giving an example. It might not be correct. Let's say video test SRC. It's a open. Uh, it's a software element which is just to generate a test video data. Now it does not have any special buffer requirement, so it will just allocate buffers on its own using let's say malloc. Now you cannot use this memory to share it with other drivers because simply it is not a DMA buff. So the only way it will work is you need to allocate buffers using DRM, share those buffers with the source element and then generate the content into it and then use it for the uh, all whatever operation you are supposed to do. So there is a dependency on content generation. So even if you want if the element wants to generate content by its own, it is not allowed to allocate buffers of its own. It, it, it needs to ask somebody else to allocate buffers for itself and then write content into it. So with this, what the, this dependency is not there because you can simply ask the <coughs> element to allocate memory from and then you can share it with the other driver. <coughs> 
So second part uh, is about the memory sharing. So in typical uh, compositor applications, you will have like uh, um, uh, graphics applications which are acting as a uh, clients, and then there is a composition server like Western or X11, Wayland. So basically, the communication between the client and the server happens via socket, and the memory is shared using the socket. Because they are, these are two different processes, you need to use shared memory to access to share buffers from, let's say, a client to a uh, server. So a typical graphics uh, example, if you take a Wayland application, so in such case, if you have a texture or a shader which is uh, run run from a client uh, application. Now that needs to be allocated in a shared memory. First, you need to allocate a shared memory and then render all your content into that. One, only then you can give that buffer to the uh, uh, VLAN server for it to uh, be displayed in a zero copy manner. If that does not happen, then you will, let's say, allocate in your own uh, application space. And then when you give that buffer to uh, VLAN that won't happen. So the way internally VLAN would do is like it will allocate a shared memory, copy your buffer from your application into the shared memory and then start using it. So by doing this you are actually essentially uh, sharing one process's memory to another process by, uh, by the means of DM above. So I think this diagram will be helpful here. So it's a simple diagram where you have like two processes, process 1 and process 2 and let's say uh, the middle level is the virtual address space and then the, the much, uh, middle level is the applications virtual address space and the final level is the physical address space. You, know, you can see that each virtual address may be mapped to like different addresses. You may have some shared, shared pages which are common for like two processes. Now if you use the virtual memory exporter driver and if you want to export one of the uh, p uh, one of the memory chunk from let's say process 1 to process 2. The way it can be done is you can uh, get this virtual address, give it to the uh, virtual memory exporter driver and then you will get the DMFD. With the socket FD passing, you can pass this FD to the different process and then map it. So once you have mapped, you are actually accessing a different process's memory as a memory from process 2. The way this uh, happens is now you can see that after the export and map the same page which was earlier part of dedicated for process 1 has now become a shared page. So in this case you are not allocating shared memory and then utilizing it. You have already utilized the memory, you have already have a buffer which is part of an application. Now by doing this you are sharing the existing buffer into another process. This is quite useful when you have to integrate let us say open source applications like you may have a lot of. Uh, so the second point here is about components allocating own memory for buffers like you will have a lot of gstreamer plugins, custom sh sh shaders and textures just for prototyping purpose you want to utilize them as is. Now if it is allocating buffers of its own you cannot pass it to a different uh, process and the, uh, the use case for passing it to different processes is also a valid use case like in case of Wayland or any display uh, compositor application you need to pass it to a server and which is going to be an essentially different process. So this will help you to uh, solve that problem without doing any buffer copy. Yes? So you're using that in, uh, in application and you end up using DMA, can you use that SHM like virtual memory directly to uh, DRM? Uh, yes, DRM does. Do you get to basically zero copy? Yes. 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 So now DRM supports importing of DM above. So as long as the buffer constraints are met, I'm not saying that you can you can export any memory, but you cannot consume any memory. So if the memory is contiguous and DRM is okay with that contiguous memory, and if it is uh, if if it satisfies all the constraints which DRM expects for importing, it will be able to share that memory with zero copy. Yes. So uh, we have not done any performance analysis, but surely uh, in the case of embedded use cases, you will not be doing lot of uh, um, uh, lot of maps and unmaps in the sense uh, 
in case you want the ad, uh, in, in case you want the access of that memory from cpu only then you will map in a regular use case yes you want the uh, uh, the device or the peripheral to access it so in in such cases only dma for buff would suffice only if you want a cpu access in that case you will do a memory mapping and as you said if you do map you need to make sure that the caches for that process is updated so that the new mapping are reflected but of course if you want to do a cpu mapping you need to make sure that the cpu uh, the cache overheads are uh, I mean, you need to uh, plan for that. Uh, I think last two points is like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, export as DM above and share across process. I have already talked about that. So basically, this is almost like share memory, but it's in a different way that you are actually uh, uh, sharing an existing memory. So you have a memory in from one process, and af after some point of time, let's say uh, you think that okay this part should have been a shared memory now the only way it can work is you allocate a new buffer which is a shared memory between two processes and then copy the contents but with this driver you don't have to actually do any copy you can just simply use the dma buff pass the dma buff using socket and then once you have the uh, done this passing you can uh, <coughs> map it to a different process I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. So I have already talked about the use cases. Of course, the first thing that I would say is uh, yeah, this solution helped us to integrate the RTOS applications with Linux. It enables uh, you to use some of the drivers which are not capable of DMA buff export. You just map the memory and then use this driver, which pro essentially provides you the DMA buff export capability. Uh, then I mentioned about the shared memory map from different drivers. Uh, okay, there is another interesting use case like uh, now I am talking about GPU and display specifically here. Only for this specific use case I am talking about. So GPU typically has a MMU. So it's not uh, like a dumb device. It is a smart device which has got a MMU. So it can handle scatter gather pages. So with this driver I am able to actually allocate a buffer from using malloc and then uh, convert it into a DMA buff and pass it to DRM. So before this DRM never supported to uh, accept any user pointer kind of use cases but with this you can just simply allocate a buffer using malloc and then uh, pass it to DRM with DM above so that was one of the uh, new use case we were able to achieve and then share a processes memory to other process I have covered that yeah and last point is about uh, the gstreamer integration where you have the software components lot of software components which are allocating memory on its own. Once they have allocated the memory, you can simply export it using DMA buff. I think, yeah, okay. So when we are talking about, you know, converting from virtual address to physical address, there are a lot of security concerns here. Like, should we be uh, doing the correct ref counting? Should we be doing the, uh, should, should we be making sure that the patches pages don't uh, get swapped out from the memory? You, do you need to make sure that, let's say, a application says that this is my virtual address and I want like 4 MB after that virtual address, but you have actually allocated only 2 MB. So application may give you wrong sizes, but it's the kernel's job to find out that there are no segmentation errors. But that generally typically happens in the case when you are doing page work, you would try to find out uh, for each page and at some point of time you will find out that there is a page fault. <coughs> now the first question that came here was how to how do you uh, handle the over commit? But yeah, th that can be handled by doing uh, by triggering the page fault so that the mapping between the virtual and f uh, physical addresses is uh, created before you try uh, doing the page work. And then there are some open questions like should we should we restrict sharing of certain memory because we now we can share any memory so we can share like data segment we can share code segment so there, there might be some security uh, concerns because you don't want to share a specific uh, segment of a process to another process so should there be any uh, constraints on to you know you want to share only the data segment or let's say uh, you want to not share a specific segment of the memory. So these are the questions which are like kept open and uh, I hope that the community would give me uh, the right uh, responses to that. Yeah, and as also one uh, men uh, gentleman mentioned that you need to handle the races between like if the application crashes or let's say a different, uh, there are multiple uses and how, how do you handle between the race case of the unmap and close. I think that's it. These are all the references. If you have any questions, 
So, this has been implemented on 4.4 kernel, but uh, I think I am planning to uh, put a proposal and then I am not really sure how much time will it take, but at least the idea will start, I will start rolling out in the mailing list and depending on how many rounds it take for the different patch sets, I cannot commit, but at least I will try my best. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you then, I am done. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, can you be a little louder? Uh, depends on who is owning the buffer. If uh, like typically the RTOS is not smart enough, like it cannot reconfigure the memory address space to have a different visibility. Typically, if you have given let us say a specific memory chunk to the RTOS, it will only have access to that memory chunk. Now, if you want to give a Linux memory uh, to RTOS, if you want to give a Linux memory to RTOS, you need to have a new mapping created for RTOS processor because it will not understand any memory which is given to uh, it while at the boot up. So, only uh, there is less static mapping done by, uh, by RTOS because you have only limited memory access and the even the address space that is there for this uh, RTOS processor is limited. So, it will not have access to like full 4 GB memory. So, if you want to uh, share Linux memory to RTOS memory, again it has to be from a specific region. You cannot randomly take any memory and say that now I want to share it with RTOS. It has to be from a dedicated piece which is already mapped into the RTOS region. Okay. So, DMFF concept is only useful for Linux. All the Linux drivers will use the DMFF. If you are taking a buffer from RTOS and then converting it into DMA buff, you can do all the operations using all the Linux drivers. Once all the operations are finished, of course, the physical memory remains the same. Now, you can give it back to RTOS without doing anything because the physical address remains to be same. It is DMA buff is only uh, Linux means of uh, accessing that buffer from user space. So, uh, once you get the list of physical addresses, you need to implement this bunch of uh, ops which is called DMA buff operations. So, there would be like map, unmap and all these operations. So, every time an uh, imported driver tries to access the actual memory, it would call attach, map, detach all those APIs and those are the APIs which needs to be implemented by the DMA buff exported driver. In this case, this driver has implemented all those APIs. So, that any time an importer calls those APIs, the corresponding actions are taken and that is all DMFF is all about. So, there, is there a concept of direction where? Yes. So, there is also, does the application specify that for you when it calls for you to map that address of DMA? Currently, it is being taken in such a way that it maps for bidirectional. So, it, at any point of time application wants to read or write, it will make sure that the DMA is always bidirectional. I see. So, you are going to take a huge access node and you are going to do Yes. So, the typical, uh, okay, uh, the intent behind uh, doing this use case is not to actually do any CPU access. In this, at least specifically in this application, you do not see uh, application working with that virtual address. It is just mapped and then converted into DMA buff, but there is no CPU access happening because all of the uh, uh, all of the operations are actually hardware accelerated. So, there is like a GPU driver, there is an encode driver and all of these are peripherals which will which are not part of CPU. So, if you just give a DMA buff that is it, CPU does not have to access it. It is just that you are creating a virtual mapping, but you are not really accessing it. If you do access it, you will have to do the uh, penalty of, I mean, cash penalty. So, this cash manipulation is what's going to be worked on our cash line. Exactly. So, I mentioned about, <coughs> I mentioned about the ABI. So, there will be an IOC, uh, there will be an IOCTL which asks, let us say an application 
willing uh, uh, willingly wants to let us say flush cash or invalidate cash. So, you will have a specific IOCTL for that. So, you can uh, once you open the slash dev slash vmem exp you can either export the buffers and then you can use the second type of IOCTL where you can say that I want to sync cash or I want to invalidate cash. So, that is an API provided to the application which in case application wants to specifically handle caches uh, on its own. In general it is considered bidirectional. Alright, any other questions? Alright, thank you then.